Hello, this lecture is the third part of the series on greenhouse peak oil and sustainable development. Today we're going to focus on the concept of peak oil and what its implications are for how we plan our cities. I'd first like to introduce the concept of peak oil and how it relates to global oil supplies. The second part of the lecture briefly looks at the situation for oil in Australia. I'd then like to discuss the relationships between supply, demand and price when it comes to the oil industry and to touch on the wider fossil fuel sector. Finally, we're going to consider the role of oil and energy in undermining prosperity and economic growth and what this means for a future world in which fossil fuel resources and climate change will place significant constraints on current patterns of development. Peak oil was first introduced by the American oil geologist Hubbard, who predicted that the US oil production would rise and then reach a peak in 1970, after which it would decline. This was fiercely contested at the time, as the US had grown into the world's leading economy, partly on the back of its rapidly growing oil industry. Indeed, as we will see, the concept of peak oil is still widely contested by economists, who believe that technology will overcome any natural resource constraints and enable ever-growing supplies of raw materials, including oil. As it turns out, Hubbard was wrong. US oil production peaked in 1971, not 1970. Subsequent discoveries of oil in Alaska, the Gulf of Mexico, and most recently in what they call tight oil deposits in the Midwest, have prevented a precipitous decline in US oil production, which is now ahead of where it was 10 years ago. But total US oil production did, did start declining from the early 1970s and is still lower now than it was then. But as you can see from the above chart, the US is far from the only country whose oil production has peaked and then declined. Norway, the UK, Australia, Mexico and many other countries have reached and now passed the peak in their oil production. In most cases, once a peak, of, peak rate of extraction is passed, Subsequent production levels continue to fall progressively unless major new discoveries are found. Unfortunately, on a global basis, most of the super large oil fields were discovered 30 to 40 years ago and new finds are generally much smaller. As a consequence, the Middle East remains and will remain the key to the world's oil industry. Some 60% of the world's oil reserves are thought to lie in this region. Ever wondered why there, we keep having Middle East wars? While oil is by no means the only factor, its strategic significance as an energy source, especially for transport, including the military, is a key factor in Middle East politics, not to mention the global economy. The graphs above are an underground cross sec or underground cross sections of the world's largest and biggest producing oil field, the Gawar oil field in Saudi Arabia which also covers some neighbouring countries. The oil rich areas are shown in purple, water in blue and oil mi water mixtures in green. Comparisons between different dates at the same location show how the volume of oil is shrinking as production has continued, being replaced by water pumped into the fields, creating water oil mixtures. Typically once the oil concentration drops below 50%, it becomes increasingly difficult to extract the remaining oil since pumping in more water simply results in water emerging at the wellhead. Even with horizontal drilling and other modern extraction techniques, it is no, not possible to extract all the oil from known oil reserves. The rate of oil flow drops once the pressure falls and the cost of extraction per barrel of oil rises as the concentration drops and more water or CO2 is needed to displace the oil. The decline of oil production from onshore fields has led to an increasing proportion of oil being sourced from offshore fields such as the North Sea, Bass Strait, the Gulf of Mexico and offshore Brazil. As the fields closest to the surface are exploited, so the drilling has had to move to deeper and deeper waters, in some cases several kilometres deep. Water pressures at such depths, as well as risks of hurricanes and extreme weather conditions, make drilling expensive and also hazardous as several major accidents have demonstrated in places like the North Sea and the Gulf of Mexico. Consequently, the cost of oil extraction 
is now much higher than it was in the 1960s, when the huge and easy to exploit fields in the Middle East were being opened up. In recent years, up until about 2008, oil prices rose rapidly, as will be discussed later. Yet crude oil production from conventional onshore and offshore sources plateaued at about 72 million barrels a day. This was because expanding production from new fields was only just able to counterbalance declining production from fields which had passed peak production. However, starting in about 2006, new sources of unconventional oil began to be developed, especially in the US through shale oil, as well as at the tar sands in Canada. Thus, the US has now regained its title as the world's biggest oil producer, though it is still imports significant volumes of oil, as it is also the world's biggest oil consumer. But hoped for increases of production in Russia and some other countries have largely failed to materialise, despite record oil prices. We turn now to the position of uh, oil in relation to Australia. Australia is really a minor player in the world oil industry, both in terms of production and in terms of consumption. As such, we are a price taker, and oil and derivatives such as petrol, jet fuel, kerosene, etc., are priced on world markets in response to global supply and demand conditions. However, we have long been a net importer of oil, as shown above. The development of the Bass Strait fields, following earlier onshore fields such as Moomba, led to a spike in production around 2000 when local production almost equaled consumption. However, even then we were an importer of heavy oils, such as used, those used in diesel fuel, etc., whilst exporting light crudes. Our oil import bill has become significant, arising both from our oil import volumes and high world prices. The illustration above indicates how significant the oil volumes used in Australia are. Whilst we are a net energy exporter due to high volumes of coal and more recently liquefied natural gas exports, the high cost of oil on an energy basis has implications for our balance of trade. 80% of our oil is used in transport, mostly road transport. As elsewhere in the world, oil is a critical source of energy and one which cannot easily be replaced. Oil can be obtained from biofuels such as from wheat but the volumes required are well beyond what could be obtained from such sources, and shifting grain production from food to oil would create major food supply problems. In the last few years, a range of oil and gas deposits in the northwest of Australia have come into production, but these have not stopped total production from plateauing and indeed falling somewhat from the 2000 peak. While new discoveries have been made, they are mostly small and increasingly the rate of discovery is falling below the rate of production meaning our oil reserves are shrinking. In summary, Australia shares with most of the developed world in being a net importer of oil and increasingly dependent on overseas supplies. Hence we are subject to the vagaries of the world oil markets. I'd now like to look in more detail at the issues of supply, demand and price. If we go back into history we can see how oil was relatively expensive around US $100 a barrel in 2009 dollars when it was first discovered in Pennsylvania in the United States. But the real price fell rapidly over ensuing decades as the US discovered vast reserves in California, Louisiana, Texas and other states. Prices fell to around 30 to 40 dollars US a barrel in today's terms by the 1940s. The subsequent massive oil discoveries in the Middle East led to real prices below 20 dollars a barrel in today's dollars during the 1950s, 60s and 70s. This was the golden age of oil, underpinning both the growth of the car industry and also the World War II economic expansion on a global basis. The OPEC-induced oil shock price shocks of 1974 and then again in 1979 saw the price skyrocket, leading to global recessions. But this was politically inspired and prices subsequently fell to around US $30 a barrel in the 1990s. The next big spike occurred in the early 2000s as rising demand hit flat supply. Prices reached over $100 a barrel prior to falling with the global financial crisis in 2008-9, then recovered again quickly to over $100 a barrel again, uh, which applied until early this year. Current prices have collapsed somewhat to around $60 a barrel by December this 2014 
as OPEC refuses to reduce supply and as the effect of the US shale oil supply boom has led to a glut. But future prices will reflect both future supply and future demand. As we all know, Australia's fortunes are increasingly dependent on China, and China is increasingly dependent on oil. China has shifted from self-sufficiency in oil to being a big importer in the last few years. So there will be increasing competition for the world's dwindling supplies of crude. This has big implications for cities, which are highly car dependent. The recent fall in oil prices has led some to believe that the peak oil pessimists are wrong and that the optimistic economists are right. To get some perspective, it's worth looking at a recent IMF paper indicated above. The authors built a dynamic model of world oil supply, demand and price based on detailed knowledge of the production prospects in particular fields, as well as the factors underpinning demand in various markets. They summarise the debate between the geologists and the economists above. A comparison of supply forecasts by both camps shows that the optimists, such as the Energy Information Agency or the EIA of the United States, have been consistently over-optimistic and have had to continually revise down their forecasts of world oil supply. For example, their 2001 forecast for 2020 was close to 120 million barrels a day. Their 2010 forecast had fallen to about 95 million barrels a day. Equally, however, if you look at the graph on the right, the peak oil pessimists, such as Colin Campbell, have tended to be too pessimistic and have had to revise their forecasts up over time. Actual oil production has actually been well below earlier EIA forecasts, but above the gloomy forecasts of the peak oil uh, protagonists. The IMF's own forecasts made a couple of years ago nevertheless show some increase in supply, but not enough to prevent a likely rise in real prices by 80% by 2020, but with a wide band of uncertainty. The graph above shows the detailed forecasts of price in US dollars a barrel. Uh, the recent fall in price over the last six months or so takes us to the bottom of the IMF forecasts. But how long this will last will depend on how long various producers, including the US shale oil producers, can keep going at prices below their marginal costs before they go bankrupt. OPEC, some of whose producers such as Saudi Arabia are still making a profit at $60 a barrel, can afford to wait until the marginal producers are squeezed out. A re-emergent of supply demand balance is likely to see prices return to $100 a barrel or more. Indeed, a major oil shock such as another Middle Eastern war could easily spark another price outbreak under those circumstances. The likelihood is that prices could well be volatile in the future, but against a rising real underlying price, as they have been since the 1970s. Coal and gas prices have also been volatile with a general, against a generally rising trend, again up until mid-2014. Coal prices reflect China's huge growth in electricity and steel production. Gas prices rose rapidly but again have now been affected by rising supply from shale gas producers. These recent developments have led to a resurgence of debate about the future of oil, gas and coal and commodities more generally. A lot will depend on the future trajectory of China's demand. For example, is their steel production going to continue to increase or is it going to taper off? Will electric cars become developed rapidly or slowly? It does appear, however, that much of the world's cheap oil has now been exploited and that oil at least will likely become more expensive in the future. Coal is a somewhat different situation as it is more abundant. Huge deposits still exist, including in Australia. But even there, they are further from the coast, for example, the Galilee Basin, and more expensive to open up than past deposits, such as those in the Hunter Valley or in the Bowen Basin. So what does all this mean for prosperity and economic growth? As shown above, there appears to be a close correlation between GDP per person and energy consumption per person with countries like the United States at the top and China and India near the bottom. A closer look, however, shows that some European countries, as well as countries such as Japan, 
have similar GDP per capita to the United States, but only at a, only around half the energy consumption per capita. The underlying problem is, of course, the population bomb. The world is in the middle of an unprecedented explosion of human population, which started only recently in historical terms. Where it will end will be critical, but end it must. No real system can continue growing indefinitely. According to some estimates, we are already using up more than one Earth. Our ecological footprint exceeds the capacity of the world's natural systems. While there can be many criticisms of the concept of a footprint, it remains the case that much of the world's ecosystems are under stress. And the rapidity of climate change may overwhelm many species, potentially including humans. To illustrate the problem, consider the impact of even modest growth rates on resource, resource exploitation. As the example above shows, and on the next page, a 2% growth rate in consumption halves the expected life of a fixed resource. Whereas this growth in resource use comes, whether this growth in resource use comes from population or lifestyle growth probably doesn't matter too much. But the rapidity of resource ex exploitation can surprise. Thus we need a good understanding of these issues in order to be able to anticipate future problems and take avoidance action. In the case of fossil fuels, as already noted, oil and gas are relatively finite. There will be some growth in reserves from new discoveries, but much has already been discovered and exploited. In the case of coal, reserves are much greater. Unfortunately, the limit on exploitation is probably more of one of a CO2 limit. As shown in the lecture on climate change, there is well and truly enough carbon in coal and other deposits to permanently alter the climate very significantly, making the world unrecognisable to current generations and causing major species extinctions. So unless CO2 can be sequestered, there will have to be limits on coal burning. The implications of all this are fairly clear and are set out above. The world economy is in fact currently based on cheap oil and fossil fuels. China and India are rapidly urbanising and 3 billion people are wanting to have the same lifestyles as the 1 billion already in advanced countries. We are already at peak production of conventional oil, although rising coal and gas and some recovery in unconventional oil means that we're rapidly heading past the safe CO2 emission limit. Climate change limits the ability of tar sands and other oil and coal uh, sources to replace conventional oil. Oil prices will continue to rise over the next 30 years, depending on world oil production, Chinese demand, etc. But there will be probably short term volatility. We only have a few decades to revamp the world economy, reduce CO2 emissions and oil consumption. These in fact will be the dominating forces for the next few de decades with profound implications for our cities and how we live, build and live our lives. We need to reduce car and oil dependence. So we need to Im involve public transport, electric cars, small electric vehicles, etc. to replace current cars and freeway systems. We also need to move long distance freight from truck to rail and sea. This is a global priority. Those cities and countries which fail to act promptly will face major economic consequences. Well, that's the end of this lecture, um, and it's up to you, your generation, to try to find the answers. Thanks very much.